reaching from way down here. Yeah. 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 From way down here. Welcome to Thread, a podcast designed to explore God's story and lead you into a full life in Christ. Thank you for joining us in this conversation, co-hosted by myself, Hannah D'Souza, and Dr. David Pochter. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Thread. Um, in today's episode, it is episode 23, and we are going to be talking about the presence in the presence of God. And we have a very special guest that we're really excited um, to have join us today, Dr. Bernard McGinn, who I'll hand over to Dave to introduce to us. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really excited to have Bernie with us or Dr. Bernard McGinn. Um, in my studies at the Oblate School of Theology, I had the opportunity to take him as one of my professors. And actually, fun story, Bernie, that I don't know that you know that will be fun to tell people. I didn't understand anything about mysticism when I entered this PhD program. And the class for the PhD students was offered as an elective. And I told my mentor, Father Ron Rollheiser, I said, why would I want to take a class on mysticism? It has nothing to do with my life. And he said, <laughs> well, you, you, you really don't properly understand it. And you're going to want to tell your grandkids one day that you had a chance to study with Dr. McGinn. Uh, I was so grateful to take that class with you. I learned so much and it's really shaped a lot of my own academic work. So it's an honor to have you here with us today. So can you tell us a little bit, Dr. McGinn, about your academic experience you taught? Where did you teach and what was your primary area of specialty? Well, I taught at the University of Chicago Divinity School for um, 34 years. I taught for a few years at Catholic University uh, before that. But I spent most of my career at the Divinity School, which is a wonderful place. Uh, I'm long retired now. I actually retired in 2003. But I continue to do uh, teaching in various places and now a fair amount of lecturing, some of it in person, but a lot more of it on Zoom. And I was hired uh, to teach the history of theology, uh, basically. Uh, I was a specialist in medieval history, but also did a lot with the church fathers, patristic. And um, more and more, my work as I taught gravitated towards the history of spirituality and the history of mysticism. I continued teaching other areas and, and writing on other areas, doctrinal areas and the like. But given the interest that's so widespread today, especially among students, both uh, college students and graduate students, and my own concerns, I was teaching more and more in the history of spirituality and the history of mysticism. And a large number of my graduate students went on to do their doctoral work in mysticism and are now you know, teaching all, all over the U.S. and in some places in Europe as well. So I think this is a great era, really, of the mm -hmm. revival of the study of mysticism and spirituality. And I've been happy to be a part of that now for a long time, over 50 years. Is that, is that yeah. helpful? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Hannah, is this uh, a topic you're familiar with or is this new for you? No, actually, which is why I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Um, yeah, it's not an area I feel very familiar with, although I did just start a class on Teresa of Avila um, this oh. semester and who I guess would be considered a mystic. Um, oh, yes. And my, my professor um, just last week held up a copy of your book. Um, it was the first <laughs> of the nine volumes <laughs> that you've written. And she said we all needed to read it. Um, and her name is Stephanie Paulsell, who I think knew you from Chicago. Yes, uh, yes at one of my students. As I said, oh. I, I have students teaching in many, many places. Yes. Okay, well, she's my teacher. <laughs> well, very good. And you, you have a wonderful teacher. She's a oh, wonderful person and a wonderful she's scholar. Wonderful. So she give, was very her my, excited. give her my regards. In your I will. Life. I'll tell her. Yeah. She was very excited to hear that I was recording this with you. Okay. Yeah. It's great. So I know, Bernie, you've, you've definitely writ, written a lot of books. Um, one of your most significant series is the Presence of God series. There's actually nine volumes. Now, for those of you that are watching the podcast online, you can see a picture that I took. 
from my own bookshelf of the nine volumes of this series. It's an encyclopedia, really, treating mysticism historically from the beginnings in the Jewish context through scripture into the early stages of church development, all the way up to the, I think you ended somewhere in the 17th century. Yes, this I really ended with quietism, although I've since then, I've written a book on modern mystics, an introduction, just uh, to kind of bring it up to date. But that series, The Presence of God, started as three volumes. That was my right. plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> Didn't work out that it, way. Uh, it, it morphed as I got into it because there was just so much material and it became so interesting. And people uh, were actually, you know, very happy to read this material. It grew and grew and grew and grew. So it took mm. A lot longer. Had I known it was going to be nine volumes, I might have been a little bit more hesitant. Right. <laughs> I live to finish it. <laughs> so it, it's amazing. It's really an amazing series. And I know for most of our listeners, this concept of mysticism is new for them, but it's not new for them. Um, and maybe you could give some kind of basic understanding or definitions. When we talk about mysticism, what exactly do we mean? Yeah, well, well, mysticism is a word that sometimes frightens people. It, it has a long, uh, long history. But I would say the basic meaning of mysticism is a search for the deeper experience of God in your life, deeper and more direct experience of God in one's life. And mysticism just happens to be the word that became associated with it from early time on because it has the meaning of something hidden, something not immediately seen. And so early on, the Christian fathers talked about the mystical meaning of scripture. That was the hidden meaning, the meaning underneath the surface. Well, they talked about the mystical sacraments, that is the meaning of things like baptism and, and the Eucharist, which had a deeper meaning that outside observers wouldn't see. I mean, a pagan living in the Roman Empire would see Christians, you know, pouring water over somebody's head and say, well, that's strange. The Christian would see their baptism and their uh, solidarity with Christ, etc. So the mystical uh, dimension of Christianity, the term that I use, is the deeper dimension, the dimension where we're seeking to find God in a more direct way than in the ordinary, uh, the ordinary run of our, our life. And many great thinkers have written uh, and, uh, about that and encouraged other believers to uh, deepen their spiritual life, as it's sometimes called, or their mystical life. That is to find God in their experience in a deeper and more and more transformative way. So that's a, a very brief way of talking about a word that will sometimes frighten people away because they say, what does that mean? And mystery, et cetera, et cetera. No, it means something that you're called to, I say, by baptism. That's part of the of the calling of baptism for any, every Christian to try to find God in their lives in a deeper and profound way and transforming and transforming mode. And we read some great mystical figures because they give us examples of that and they teach us about that and they encourage us to, uh, to follow that, that dimension of our life. People like Teresa of Avila, <clears throat> John of the Cross, Meister Eckhart, Bernard of Clairvaux, and in the modern era, people like Thomas Merton, one of the figures that I wrote up in my book on, on modern mystics. Because they've had that experience, and they also have uh, been empowered to try to spread the message. So that's a kind of I, brief introduction. Yeah, I remember one of the things you said that helped me when we were studying this in class was there's a lot of people who are capable of playing basketball, but not everybody plays the same. Um, and not everyone can teach others to do the same. And so, so it's not just that we have this, our own experience with God, but how we express it, how vibrant it is, how we communicate and teach to others. That's so when we talk about someone being a mystic, what crosses that line from someone having that deep connection with God to them being called a mystic? Well, I think the mystics are the kind of paragon figures who uh, have achieved a consciousness of God that goes beyond what most of us uh, are able to reach in this life. And then, as I said, they have been given a vocation to say, well, it's not just for me. It's a message that I should spread. 
Some of them spread it just by by their conversation and by their way of life. Others spread it by their teaching and by their writing. And so the, the mystical tradition uh, consists of everybody who's had this deeper experience of God. But it's concentrated on those people who have felt compelled to make that public to try to teach and encourage uh, and encourage others. And that's right back to the beginnings of Christianity to the, you know, the very earliest mm-hmm. period. And even some of the texts in the New Testament, some of the Pauline texts and Johannine texts lend themselves to uh, to that uh, that search for God's deeper presence. And these are texts. I mean, the whole of Scripture does that. But there are certain particular parts of Scripture that you might say are more uh, encouraging of that of that mystical context. The same way in the Old Testament, certainly the Psalms have always been a very crucial uh, text. But the Song of Songs, both for Jewish and Christian mm-hmm. mystics, you know, because they don't read it just as uh, just as uh, love songs, a personal uh, love song, <laughs> but as emblematic and revealing of the love between God and His community and God and the individual soul. So the Song of Songs and the Psalms are the two uh, classic mystical texts, mm. you might say, in the Old Testament, the way the Gospel and Epistles of John and some of the Pauline texts are in the New Testament. Because uh, mysticism for Christianity is always rooted in Scripture. It's not, mm. it's not personal experience has to come from our understanding of Scripture. And the personal experience and the scriptural books are related. But uh, mysticism in Christianity traditionally has always been deeply scriptural. And the great mystical texts are often you know, interpretations of scripture. Which is really fantastic. Um, and, and you just touched on something that really ties us into our story today. So we've been on this journey through this narrative of the Old Testament. Yeah, We have been now coming through the Exodus story, we're now in the wilderness. <laughs> and in our story, one of the first things that we recognize in the story it, with where we are is this pillar of cloud and fire appears. And this pillar of cloud and fire is kind of this guiding presence for Israel as they're coming through the Red Sea, and it has an active role in this. And so I think where we want to start today is is with that, like, how can you comment on why is this important that there's now this pillar? So we know that Yahweh's been engaged and involved in Israel's life. Why is there a pillar of cloud and fire, and why is that important? Well, I think as human beings and embodied uh, embodied creatures, we need physical things. We need physical manifestations in order to to draw us towards God and give us a deeper sense of God. And this is true as much today, but it's particularly true, I think, in the times of the Old Testament. The people of Israel needed something that they could see, something Mm -hmm. that they could uh, relate to, something that they could be impressed by, which is what the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire would would do. So these are manifestations of the divine presence. At a later Mm -hmm. time, obviously, uh, some people will be able to experience God's presence without a lot of external uh, physical appearances. I think for the vast majority of people, and especially for the people here who are described in the uh, in the Old Testament, something physical that would manifest that God is with them, God is protecting them, and something that would be a you know powerful some uh, powerful manifestation that they could admire. In the ancient Christian uh, text, they talk about theophania, theophanies which in Greek just means manifestation of God. So these are theophanies in theological terms. That is very powerful images and presences that reveal God to his, to his people. So the pillar and, and, and other things are uh, crucial examples of what are called theophanies. Yeah, so in our story so far, in these last 22 episodes, we have talked a lot about Yahweh's intent on relationship. Um, We talked about the story of our faith in the very beginning, and that God's intent in Genesis 1 and 2 is to build this temple city where we could reside with God. We've talked about the importance of our human creator relationship. We talked about um, the flood, and that Yahweh was actually or absolutely intent on 
not abandoning this relationship expectation, so he started over. Uh, we talked about the importance of him starting with Abraham and this covenant that he built. We even walked through the suzerain vassal treaty and why it was important to demonstrate, as you said, this physical, explicit way of demonstrating the importance of the relationship. Um, we did a whole episode on Jacob's wrestling match with this divine being, which yeah. is a theophany, right? right? Yes, exactly. Um, then we got to Moses and coming into Egypt and the wilderness for himself and his own transformation, him seeing this burning bush, again, an explicit demonstration of this connection yes. with Yahweh. So now we get into the wilderness and we're seeing a number of things manifest. So we see this daily dependence on manna, right? which is communicating the importance of this connection. Uh, Yahweh's has to provide water. Yahweh's providing leadership. But then this pillar, as we just talked about, and we'll read a, a scripture about it here in a second, but the pillar becomes kind of this tent of meeting, becomes this tabernacle, becomes this temple. It seems to develop in how it presents itself, this connection. Right, right. And, and one other important thing to note is this all happens in the desert. The desert okay. is a very powerful biblical symbol because the desert is where you go to meet God. In, and, you know, God can kind of get forgotten in the bustle of the city and then in society where so much else is going on. So the great prophets and leaders, and Moses and, and Jesus, <laughs> with his 40 days and 40 nights and that, they go out into the desert. Because in the desert, there are less distractions. And in the desert, you really get to meet. You and God have a personal encounter. Uh, so the, the image of the desert and the history of the desert theme in the scriptures, both the Old Testament and New Testament, is absolutely vital. And the first monks, what did they do? Mm. They went out into the desert. They escaped society and all the problems of society. And they went out to find God in the, uh, in the desert. So the desert is another one of these themes that runs throughout the whole of what, what you're doing in this series, I think. Yeah. Hannah, do you know I'm smiling? <laughs> yes. Well, I was about to say, I love that you brought that up because we've been studying out the desert and the wilderness and the role that it plays in our development or in the development of leaders and um, spiritual figures throughout the Hebrew Bible. Um, also in our own development, kind of these wilderness times these desert times are important. And actually, I asked Dave a question last, I think it was the last episode, um, about whether the desert is something we should seek out in order to assist us in our development as a, like in a place to meet God, or whether the desert is something that finds us. I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, and there is a spirituality of the desert today where a number of people have written about their experiences going out into the desert, either to live there or for particular periods that we could well call retreats or something. Many of the great mystics and spiritual writers talk about the inner desert mm -hmm. and the necessity of going within to a place that's peaceful, that's separated from the ordinary you know, troubles and, and disturbances of society. So the desert is both an outer location and an inner location. And that, again, is a is a theme that works its way through uh, the whole history of uh, of Christian thought and Christian mysticism, especially. Hannah, this might be a good place for us to look at the, the story in Exodus 13 of where we are with this pillar of cloud and fire. Could you read that one for us? Yeah. So it's Exodus 13, 20 to 22. It says, they set out from Succoth. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Okay, so we've already talked a little bit about this manifestation, but uh, Bernie, could you share with us a little bit about how have God's people historically thought about this pillar of cloud and pillar of fire? Well, you know, it's been pointed out by modern biblical scholars that uh, these images relate to the ancient Near East, mm 
and they can be symbols used not only by the Israelites, but by other people about the God who protects them. Uh, traditionally, the kind of warrior God, the strong God who's going to defend his people. And the uh, the storm God is the one, you know, lightning and thunder and and the like. So those kind of images in the ancient Near East, remember the ancient Israelites lived there, would be very understandable to people that this is a manifestation of a God who's going to protect his people. He's the strong God, the warrior God who will protect them against their enemies. And these, of course, are the Israelites moving out into the into the desert and trying to escape their enemies who are after them, uh, the, the Egyptians. So that symbolism, it, it was both historically rooted very much in their times, but then also because it's in the scripture, becomes an important part of the way in which Christians thought about the presence of God and image the presence of God, symbolize the presence of God. It actually ties in exactly with this next passage we were going to read. Uh, so how about if I read this one, Hannah, and uh, then you can take it. But it says in Exodus fourteen nineteen, the angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. So the cloud was there with the darkness. It lit up the night. And one did not come near the other all night. It's that protection imagery, yes. right, that you just yes. talked about. Right. Yeah. And their defender, the protector and defender against their against their opponents, their foes. And of course, another, I mean, the, the figure of the angel as the messenger of God is another kind of theophany. And uh, of course, they're very powerfully imaged in the whole of the, uh, of the Old Testament. Remember in Abraham and Genesis 18, where the three figures appear who are described as, as angels and are manifestations of God. And that is much used by later Christians, even as a kind of foreshadowing of the Trinity, because there are three, there are three figures. That was something I noticed in this passage was there's both an angel of God and the pillar of cloud that are making the same movement from before the Israelites to behind them. And I wanted to ask you whether you consider those the same thing or what you make kind of of these different manifestations of the presence of God. Well, I, I think, you know, God goes so far beyond what we can imagine and even think about that the variety of the manifestations is what's important. Uh, so that the pillar, the angel, uh, uh, the burning bush is another one, of course. These are all different manifestations, different theophanies that tell us something about the nature of God, but they can't exhaust it. And that's why uh, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you have these different manifestations because you can't capture God in any single image. But an image will tell you something about the divine nature and another image will tell you something else. So that's why the theophanies are multiple and not just mm. one all the time uh, repeating itself. That's great. So we're going to move this pillar. We see this pillar of cloud and fire uh, that that becomes something else. It starts taking on a different, more permanent form in Israel's uh, story. And we see this call in Exodus 25. If you could read, Hannah, these first nine verses, we see this image that now Yahweh wants the Israelite people to build a tabernacle where his presence will dwell. Can you read that one for us, Hannah? The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to take for me an offering from all whose hearts prompt them to give you shall receive the offering for me. This is the offering that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and crimson yarns, and fine linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, fine leather, acacia wood, oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and for the breastplate and they shall make me a sanctuary so that i may dwell among them in accordance with all that i show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and of all its furniture so shall you make it so it says that they're actually going to build a sanctuary so that yahweh could dwell among them so we see this movement towards a pillar that moves to a more permanent fixture. What, why is that important here? 
that we're moving to a more permanent fixture? Well, I think uh, one of the things that suggests about the whole history of the Jewish people is the idea that God would give them a land and that God would live with them in the land and he would manifest themselves in the land. They would no longer be wanderers wandering mm. the face of the earth and, you know, following this pillar and cloud, etc. But God would be present with them in the land that he would give them. And that presence would be manifested here in a permanent way, first of all, by the tent, and then later on, the successor of the tent in the temple. And uh, the temple, of course, as you were saying right from the beginning, right from the Genesis account, the importance of the temple colors the whole, you know, very much so into the New Testament uh, oh. as, as well. I mean, when you, I've been just uh, reading and commenting the uh, commentaries on the Gospel of John. Uh, but when you know when when Christ uh, talks about the destruction of the temple, you know he says that he will be able to uh, to rebuild that temple in three days. And you say, well, how can you do that? It was forty six years in building. The third um, chapter, no, second chapter in John says he was talking about the temple of his body. The temple of his body. And Jesus' body as the new temple of God is one of the dominant themes of the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John. Right, right, right. So it's interesting that you're, so there's this establishment that's that's changing. There's a, the narrative's kind of changing from this wandering people to starting to build something that's going to be more lasting. Um, God is setting them up to go into the promised land. It will eventually become this... Um, this temple that, of course, we we read the story about how that becomes more of a fixed figure or fixture, sorry, and the importance of all that. But there's something that happens, and and that maybe we could talk about when the tabernacle's built, and then eventually when the temple's built. There's this glorious presence that fills it, right? And I believe the Jews started calling it the Shekinah presence. Um, and I, I think it'd be good to read this where we see the glory fill the tabernacle. Hannah, could you read Exodus 40, 34 to 38? Yeah. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. So this presence now takes this leadership role with Israel. Um, when the presence moves, they move. When it stops, they stop. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, this active presence, and, and even why, why is it called the Shekinah presence? What is that about? Well, I mean, and, and the term glory, uh, you know, the kabod in, uh, in Hebrew and doxa in Greek, the, these terms are really other words for the, really a divine being, what philosophers might speak of as God's essence. I mean, these are different ways of speaking about the reality of God. So the glory, uh, you know, for us, what we might think of some shining light or something like that, it would include that, but it'd be more than that. Because it really means that the God's reality is present there. And God's reality shows itself in things that we find, you know, tremendously different, tremendously impressive. Uh, you know, tremendously admirable, and that's what the scriptures are talking about when they use the, the term glory, both in the uh, Hebrew Bible and then later on in the in the New Testament as well. So the, these are gradually developing ways of talking about God's presence through the experience of the people as they, you know, move through their journey from slavery to freedom of the promised land and the experience of God and the place where God will be found, where he's said that he will stay and remain, which is the temple. And you know that because it's filled with God's glory. They know that the presence is there. And the, and the, you know, the prophets that think of Isaiah chapter six, for example, 
Isaiah, he's in the temple and the temple is filled with the glory of God. And he has this tremendous experience of the, of the divine theophany and, you know, where, where he's given his, uh, his prophetic role. Now you've seen this now go out and speak as a prophet that is speak for the Lord. Right. So it's interesting to kind of unpack this because we see this, this visual presence become so important. And obviously they knew that God was present in their life before these physical manifestations. Um, but this physical presence takes on more and more of a permanent form. It becomes so integral into the way Israel thinks about their relationship with Yahweh, right? So when we now think about this in Jewish history or Christian history, this presence of God, this starts moving us to this conversation about our own spirituality. Why, why it's so important for us to think about this, why we need these either physical manifestations or places that we pray or ways to think about the presence of God when we know philosophically, as you say, you know, God is there. We know God is there. God is everywhere. Why do we need these physical presences? Why, and why is, or maybe a better question is, how have people thought historically about that? And how has that driven the development of mysticism? Yeah. Well, uh, first of all, we're, we're embodied human beings who are not pure spirits. So uh, God manifests himself to us through physical forms and through bodies. And of course, uh, the whole history of Christianity is that the ultimate physical bodily manifestation of God is not the temple. It's Jesus Christ, who is the new temple of God. And Christian mysticism, then, is always necessarily Christological. It looks back to the figure of Christ that's found in the New Testament and then believes in the presence of God in the church uh, today that can be experienced by Christians. So uh, the physicality is, I think, still present, uh, but present in a different ways. And for Christians, it's, it's uh, culminating in the physical presence of God in Jesus Christ, who is still active within his church. It's not as if he's, you know, he has no longer physically here, but for believers, he's here in his body, and his body is the church. So the, the physical nature and the bodily nature is still, I think, central to the way in which people experience the presence of God, although the forms have changed. It's no longer a physical temple. It's no longer the fact that we can, you know, see Christ on the street corner. But do we believe Christ is present uh, still in a real way through his uh, through his body? And it's a whole question of belief, as the mystics uh, often say. You know, lots of people in uh, in Judea uh, in the time of Christ who saw him but didn't believe, just thought he was some you know kind of charlatan or or whatever. Um, but he's still present today. But it's a question of belief that that presence is. Uh, it, in the church and in the way in which people experience right so that the physicality and the theophanies are still with us it's not like they've been left behind but they've transformed in terms of christian belief especially the belief of the mystics they've been transformed in different ways particularly through the through the incarnation there's a lot of people that i know in our even in the fellowship of churches that han and i are part of who've come across a book um Brother Lawrence's book, Practicing the Presence of God. Oh, Hannah, yes. have you? Yeah, one, wonderful book. Have you read that one, Hannah? Yeah, I remember reading that when I was younger. And I think what struck me was the word practice um, and what that means. Why is it important to kind of practice the presence of God? Uh, many think we're just dwelling in it. So, what's the difference between kind of a practice versus just it, well, God always being present? How might we be more in his presence, um, if that's possible? Well, I think I it's, a, it's a classic book uh, if, from that perspective. And by the way, it's a very ecumenical book. So remember that Brother Lawrence uh, was not a priest. He was a lay brother in the Carmelite order in the 17th century. He um, was not very well educated at all. He was a former soldier, actually, who became a monk. And he was the cook. Oh, the cook and the sandal <laughs> maker. In the yep. uh, in, in the monastery, the Carmelite monastery in, in Paris, uh, 
But he, he realized, uh, even though he didn't have much education, what was central to practice uh, to the Christian life was to get the sense of the presence of God. And you had to do that by practice. You had to find out a form that you could uh, that you could live so that that's constantly in your mind. There's a thing about where God is always present, but we forget about him. We right. don't revert to the fact that God's present. Brother Lawrence says, look, I'm going to teach you how to, uh, to be conscious of God and to adopt very simple practices that will allow you always to remember and to live from your sense of God's presence in your life. And so he has very simple prayer forms. Um, he emphasizes certain basic Christian, particularly the question of Christian faith. But he, he constantly tells you that these have to be practiced. He gives you little things to say and little things to do in order to keep that, that presence of God. And I think that's what attracts so many people about that book and why it was picked up by all Christians, not just Catholics, mm -hmm. uh, but also by so many Protestants uh, from the time it first appeared, the end of the seventeenth, uh, end of the seventeenth century. So it's a wonderful book, and it can be practiced by anybody, you know, even those simple people in the world. <clears throat> you know, he was a cook, and one of his sayings, as recorded by a priest who knew him well, was, he said, "No matter what I'm doing, I always think about the presence of God. Even when I'm flipping my little omelet, I think oh. about God. <laughs> and when I'm flipping my omelet and I have a little time." I get down on my knees and I continue to think about God. So when you're cooking your omelets, always think about the presence. It's good. That's the good. Phrase, That's the good. phrase that struck me from the book was him describing himself as being in continual conversation with God. Exactly. Which is kind of yeah. what you described, yeah. flipping omelets and, and prayer. And I love that that was his background, that you don't need this high education to be a mystic. You no, know, it's, it's such a simple book, but powerful book. And both uh, Protestant and Catholic mystics, you know, have treasured that book throughout the course of the three centuries, uh, continually read and appreciated. Yeah, I remember finding that book 25 years ago, and it was very, it's very small, it's yep. very simple, but it's very profound. The other one that I came across a, a long time ago was Thomas Kelly's Testament of Devotion. And similarly, and Kelly, talks, Kelly read Brother Lawrence. And he did. Yes, Kelly he did. read yeah. Brother Lawrence. Um, but this idea of how do we practice living simultaneously in the world and connected to the presence of God, that simultaneity was a huge part of what he talked and taught about. Um, so maybe as we conclude, Bernie, I know you teach a lot about the history of mysticism and you have a number of books, even a a compilation book that talks about that, that grabs um, different excerpts from different mystics. And some of that is really helpful. If you were to recommend, like what would be besides brother Lawrence practicing the presence of God, are there other books or things that you would encourage people that want to explore this more as a good starting place? Well, I sometimes get asked that, that question when I give talks on mysticism in parishes and other contexts. And there are, there are some mystics who are much easier to read. They're more accessible. Mm -hmm. Others are heavily theological and take a lot of background. Uh, the great English uh, mystic Julian of Norwich mm -hmm. and her, her revelations. Uh, she's a very powerful theologian, but her books are very accessible because you can hear her voice. And she starts out by talking about her visions of Christ on the cross and the passion. And then she reflects on them. But I always find her a much more accessible author than some others where you need a theological background or, or some kind of training. Uh, so okay. Julian Narch would good, be a good place to start. Uh, okay. The, uh, Kelly knows is very influenced by the great imitation of Christ. And that's, right. that's still a wonderful spiritual and mystical book, I would argue. Um, and uh, one of the most widely read in the whole history of Christianity, you know, from the from the time of the 14th century. So there are some, there are some introductory works uh, yep. like Brother Lawrence, like The Imitation of Christ. And I, I would say Julian of Norwich, that might be good places to start. There are other yeah. books that are very rewarding. Uh, I'm thinking of Meister Eckhart's sermons, for example. And they will appeal mm -hmm. to some people, but other people will find them a little too difficult theologically. So there's different yeah. strokes for different folks, I think, in the history of, uh, of mystics. That's fair. Yeah. That's fair. 
<laughs> well, it's been a real honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for making time to join us. Yeah, and... well, thank you for inviting me. I was happy to talk about these these issues. That's great. Well, what we're going to be doing is next week, we have another guest, Hannah, right? We're going to be introducing the priesthood and the law next week. And so we'll have a guest from Chicago, another guest from Chicago, Tanner Versage, will be joining us next week. Okay. So thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week on Thread. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. All right. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you for joining this Thread Conversation. We're more than a podcast. Check out threadpodcast.org for more immersive content. Though I'm way down here, I get a better view of this boundless world.